There's a passage in the Dhammapada where the Buddha said that life as a householder is difficult. Life as a monk gone forth is difficult. And then he ends by saying, so be neither. Of course, what he means by that is by find a way of not having to be anything at all. And that requires practice. That's a skill. And that's the skill we're working on right here. The skill that takes you out of having to live, live the household life or have to live the life of a monk. Without this skill, those are the only choices you have. Those are the two big choices you have. And then from there, there are lots of other little choices, but they're all trapped inside those two categories. So what you're looking for is a path of practice that leads you to freedom from any kind of category at all. Because as the Buddha said, what you are is limited, measured by what you cling to. So it has to be a path of practice that gets rid of clinging. When you hold on to the body, that's what you are. When you hold on to your feelings, that's what you're classified as, a feeling clinger or a perception clinger, mental fabrication and consciousness clinger. You create your identity by what you cling to. This is why the Buddha never answered questions about what a human being is, because a human being can be almost anything. And so it's this Noble Eightfold Path that we're following here. This is the path that gets us out of having to be identified with anything, being limited to anything. That's the trick. That's the skill we're working on. And it's not easy either. But when you realize that all the alternatives out there are difficult, then you realize it doesn't make much sense to focus on the difficulties, because at the very least this is a path of practice that leads to the way out. A few years back, when I had a sense that a John Sawat was going to pass away, I went to see him in Thailand. And it was just inspiring and heartening to see him, because even though he after his accident, he was through a lot of difficulties, paralyzed from the base of the spine on down, brain damage, lung damage, having to deal with very difficult people looking after him. Still, he always maintained his good cheer. And one of the last things he said to me was this, he began to notice that the perceptions that his brain was sending to him were getting weirder and weirder all the time. And he just learned how to, had to learn how not to listen to them. He said, but that thing that I got from my meditation, that hasn't changed. That's always there. That thing, that's what he called it. That's the freedom we're looking towards, working towards. So no matter what happens in terms of aging, illness, and death, There's always that thing there. That's the place we'd like to be. And so as we were saying last night, the customs of the Noble Ones is to take delight in being on this path. Because it's a path of letting go, it's a path of developing. 
You're letting go of certain patterns of thought, patterns of action, patterns of speech. The ones that get in the way of clear knowing. And you develop the qualities that encourage clear knowing. Right view, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. You learn to take enjoyment in this. You let it capture imagination. They've done studies of people who are expert in their fields, particularly fields where it involves skill of various kinds. And one of the most important factors they've discovered is that it captures their imaginations. One, they like doing it. Two, they like rising to the challenge. And if they've made mistakes, they try to learn from them. They tell the admissions office to a very famous school of surgery. And for years they were working on the questions to try to figure out who it would they could find, what questions they could ask that would weed out the people who were smart but didn't have the potential to be surgeons from those who did have the potential. Because it was one of the best schools in the country, everybody they were getting had great grades, great recommendations. But that was no guarantee that they'd actually be good when they were faced with a patient on the table. And they discovered that the question that was most precise and most accurate in figuring out who to admit and who not to admit was actually was a pair of questions. One was, can you tell us about a mistake you've made recently? And if they had people say, well, I can't think of any mistakes I've made recently, they'd, those were not the people they'd accept. The second question was, what would you do differently if you had a chance to do it again? And if the person had, was able to jump right in, well, I figured out that I might try this the other time. That was the kind of person they wanted, the person who would look at his actions or her actions, recognize a mistake, and then want to figure out how to not make that mistake again and use their ingenuity trying to figure out another approach. And all the way across the board, in terms of musicians, sportsmen, the people who find that what they're doing captures their imaginations. So the question of putting an effort into it is, is not a big deal. They like thinking about it, they like looking at the particular problems they face, and sometimes imagining problems that other people might not even notice, or noticing those problems themselves, and then trying to work out a solution for them. These are the kind of people who did well. And this is the same principle in the those customs of the noble ones, delighting in letting go, delighting in developing, finding that working on the qualities of your mind really captures your imagination. So the difficulties of living in a community with other people who are practicing, those aren't big issues. You've got the rules, you've got the structure here, you've got the support to do the practice. It's not so much a question of learning about Buddhism, it's using the tools that Buddhism offers to learn about your own mind. And particularly look at the habits, look at the things the mind is doing. And we can notice that what you're doing is causing suffering to yourself or other people. You can either have the tools to change those habits, or you can use your own ingenuity. And when you find that that captures your imagination, then the, the difficulties don't really impress themselves on your mind. So remember, the whole purpose of all this is to 
Focus on what's actually happening in your mind. This big question of what are you doing that's causing unnecessary suffering for yourself or for other people. And what can you do to stop doing that? This applies not only to things you do in the same, but also the way your mind operates, the way you, the mind treats itself, deals with its own thoughts, deals with its own feelings. You want this question to take over. What this requires is a shift in, this, in your center of gravity. Because for a lot of us, we have a strong sense of who we are, what we like, and what we don't like. And then there's this activity we have to do. And if our sense of ourself, of who we are, is the, the absolute, and the question of what we're going to do becomes relative, then you never really get into it. If you switch that around, if the question of becoming more and more skillful, causing less and less harm, that becomes your absolute, while your sense of who you are becomes relative to that question. Then you find that the path is a lot easier, it's a lot more enjoyable. It makes sense. This is why the Buddha focused his Four Noble Truths on precisely this, because that's what the Four Truths are. It's an issue of Skillful action, desirable result, unskillful action, undesirable result, sorting those out. And that's for the other questions concerning the world, whether the world is eternal or not, finite or not, or your sense of who you are. Is, is there something, is our life principle separate from the body, or is the life principle the body itself? How about after death? As an enlightened person, does, it ex does that person exist, not exist, both, neither? Those questions get set aside. Those are not the issues. The issue is what is skillful, what is unskillful. When those questions become the center of your awareness, the center of your concern, when they capture your imagination, then issues of world and self fall to the wayside. That gives you a beginning sense of what it's like to be freed from this question of what you are, who you are, what kind of person you are. Because you realize that it's all determined of by the skill with which you act, and particularly the skill with which you approach your, your clingings, your attachments. Those are the determining issues. When you learn how to practice Develop concentration, develop discernment to see through those clingings, and the whole need to have to identify yourself or limit yourself, measure yourself, just goes by the wayside. And because that self is so much play such a huge role in the sense of what's difficult and what's hard and what's <laughs> suffering or not. You find that even as you go along the path, there's a, there's a lightening of those burdens you carry around. Even more so when all the clinging is gone. That's it. to be defined by anything at all. There's that passage where the, there's a monk who's been asked by some people from outside of the Buddha's teaching, how does the Buddha answer this question about whether the enlightened person exists or not after death? And he says, well, there's, there's got to be an answer besides the four that are usually given, existing, not existing, both, neither. 
And they all make fun of him and say, you don't know anything about the Buddha's teaching. Even people outside the teaching do that. So he goes to see the Buddha. And the Buddha says, how can you say anything like that? Can you identify where the Tathagata is right now? Can you define him in terms of any of the five aggregates? Well, no. As something separate from the five aggregates? Well, no. It doesn't know. There's nothing there that you could point to, even here in the present moment, unlike your ordinary person who can be identified with his clingings. And Buddha said, well, you can't even identify the Tathagata here and now. How can you say anything about what he, what, what he is after death? Or how he exists, or how what his mode of being is after death. Total freedom. That's what this is all about. And if the idea of total freedom captures your imagination, then the difficulties just get smaller and smaller. Even though they may be large, in, in your mind they loom smaller and smaller. There's that passage in the canon where the Buddha said, if you could make a deal every day for a hundred years, you'd be willing to be speared by a hundred spears in the morning, a hundred spears at noon, a hundred spears in the evening. Okay, three hundred spear wounds every day. But with a guarantee that at the end of a hundred years you'd gain full awakening. He'd say there'd be a, a deal worth taking. And when the awakening came, you wouldn't consider that it had been gained with difficulty. It's up to us to whether we find that passage intriguing. But then again, you can look at the alternative, what life is like if you don't. 